So as we did last year, I'm going to insert right now a moment of reflection with my own words. There was an architect, archaeologist, Marcelino Sanz de Sartola. He was working in the 1870s at the end of the 19th century. He, it turns out, accidentally discovered, fell upon, happened upon the painted caves of Altamira in Cantabria, Spain, because he was hunting for paleo artifacts, scrambling on the floor, digging as happens on most archaeological expeditions. Until one day, we are told, in this extraordinary story that has managed to pass through the generations to us now, until one day, he took his eight-year-old daughter, Marie, with him. Marie arrived in the caves as she's watching her father dig on the floor and tugging her father's hand, suddenly calls to him and says, Papa, look, look, look up. And there above Sans de Sartola's head, there in the same cave he had entered multiple times was what was to be recognized as the famous, outstanding, polychromatic cave paintings of Altamira. Those cave paintings discovered and dated a few years later, dated to be 36,000 years old. Cave paintings that changed everything for archeologists, for an understanding of art, for an understanding of what was happening to our ancestors in Europe. It was an extraordinary discovery, but the way it was discovered was by a child looking up, which makes it all the more poignant. This story sets a tone for us as we begin this new year. Things have been tumultuous, chaotic even, not just in our own country, but the world. And we must, if we are, to make best use of this period, we must be able and ready to reach for an audacious appreciation of what is above and below above our heads and below our feet because otherwise we will miss what is happening in our own small lives even as the world turns around us this past year emerging from covid the war in ukraine who would have thought there would be a war just in europe so close to us the backward flow of reproductive rights in the US and maybe beyond, righteous dissent that makes it harder every day to disagree in the public sphere, even with things that you might be thinking that you have not completed in your own life or new habits that you truly wanted to begin this past year, or maybe old ones that you wanted to lose sooner than this moment as we begin this new year. Even with all that looking back on these 12 months, I want to share tonight an audacious optimism of one thing we can be proud of and ambitious for. Because the miracle is where you are standing. And as Rabbi Sheffer Gold has written, sometimes we just do not see it. And that's what I want to hold on to tonight as we begin this journey together. I want to hold on to what happens in these four walls with us as a congregation. The writer Rebecca Solnit talks of the difference between hope and faith. Hope, she says, is based on evidence, she suggests. Like you can rely, you can say this is likely to happen because this has happened in the past. Whereas faith is more audacious more radical, braver, because it is when you have nothing to rely on, you are just hoping and praying that things could be good. When you cannot imagine how things will turn out, you still hold on to faith. And I look around the room tonight and I imagine all of you have had a taste of that kind of faith. So whilst I will talk more about hope tomorrow, tonight I want to talk about faith and to say that we have so much to learn from the caves of Altamira and what Marcelino Sanz de Sartola and his daughter discovered. 
1905, Virginia Woolf wrote that the future is dark, but then she added, but actually maybe the future being dark is what it always should be because it's opaque and we don't know what's coming. And that's okay. We will be strong for what's coming. But I want to remind us that we need to look up and down in our own lives, in the smaller domestic parts of our own lives and our congregation to be reminded that faith and goodness exist. The miracle is where you are standing. And even while you have your eyes trained on the horizon, I urge you to look closer because it is right here. That's what happened to me when I arrived at FPS 11 years ago, because we had a Sans de Sotala. Well, actually we had a Maria, his daughter, more to the, more to the point. Someone who gave small views of the world, but gave us big discoveries of how much love could operate here in a congregation. We had Morris Needleman. Many of you remember Morris. A member of this congregation since he was a child, raised lovingly by his parents who honored his special needs and limited abilities. Morris was raised to believe that he was worthy of cherishing. And I believe that this synagogue helped him know that. In fact, I know this synagogue helped him. When I arrived here in 2011, Morris came to synagogue every Friday evening without fail. Indeed, if he did fail, it was incredibly useful because the congregation would know to check up on him and to reach out to him. Morris had few folk in his life. And once he retired or was retired from the decent branch of Mosbros who employed him, we, this synagogue, was his family, his life, his community. We and a charming gentleman that lived in a flat above him in Stokes Court who would share cheddar and crackers with him after every Friday evening service once Morris returned. Morris would always tell us that. And indeed, one week I noticed that the cheddar and crackers were still on his jacket and suggested, shall I help you have your jacket cleaned? And suddenly it was a revelation to him that Morris took his jacket to dry cleaners and told me about it whenever he did. <laughs> what I observed was how Morris was loved here. And I was only too delighted to share in the love that he received. Morris, some of you re may remember who were regular and have been regular Friday night attendees, Morris would speak in a loud, whispered reverence through candle lighting, offering a very audible, oh dear, oh dear, when someone's match didn't light correctly. And when I added my questions on a Friday night, when I added my questions before Kiddush, why are boys, I would ask our congregation, blessed to be like Ephraim and Manasseh and not like Jacob and Abraham and Isaac? It would be Morris every week who would volunteer the answer. And we adored it and let him do it. Even our children knew that it was Morris's question and Morris's answer. <clears throat> Members like Morris were and indeed still are a barometer of how we operate in this congregation. Do we get it right? Do we truly see each other, but Selim Elohim, where everyone is noticed and known and where we make special attempts to include everyone that needs it? More of but Selim Elohim tomorrow. But tonight I always say that it's you regulars Mostly you regulars come. Many of you at home are perhaps making Yom Tov meals, not able to come into the synagogue. But there is something intimate about the crowd on Erev Rosh Hashanah. And this story that I share now is so critical to how we hold on to our synagogue, how we hold on to our congregation, how we hold on to the legacies of people like Morris and hope to build more in our synagogue, in our congregation, indeed in this very building itself. So there is a story of a congregation that lived in the northernmost part 
of the northernmost country in the world. It was a teeny congregation in a tiny village, and yet they were very connected to each other. So connected to each other that they'd never built a synagogue. They decided that why would they need a synagogue when they were able to celebrate Shabbat in each other's homes. If there was a bar mitzvah, they'd gather squashed in the tiny homes because most people lived in small homes in this tiny village, in this tiny congregation. They lived like that. They were mostly poor. There was no electricity in this village. Each home, each person in every home would have one light to be able to light what they needed in their home. And the congregation for many years managed to just celebrate with each other, to be with each other, and they would squash into individual homes when they needed to. But one year something changed and they had more of a sense of audacious optimism and hope that their congregation might grow, that they could build something where they could all be together. Not one family visiting another family in one of the tiny homes, but what if they could all be together in a synagogue together? They decided they would be build a synagogue building, but they were worried. There were a lot of competing desires in their synagogue building. They wanted it to be big enough that they could dance the horror and celebrate. I'm having an image of Franklin and Alex wedding, which was teeny, but they danced the horror in this space. They wanted it to be small enough that no one would be left out, that there would be no corners where people would be shirking or standing and not welcomed fully in every kiddush. They wanted it to be warm in the winter, so there would be a stove in the winter. They wanted it to be airy and have windows in the summer. They wanted it to be a place where everyone would feel welcome and able to be. Lo and behold, there were a brother and sister in this village who had been very instrumental in building these tiny, teeny homes for everyone. A builder and an architect. They were able to think really carefully about what might be needed. They'd been taught the craft by their own parents and they volunteered. They would build the synagogue. They took very seriously all the desires from all members of the community. It needs to be warm in winter. It needs to be cool in the summer. You'll notice the doors open now so we can imagine if we had a wood burning stove here. They needed the windows to be bright to let in light. They needed it to be big and small. They needed it to suit everyone in the congregation. So this brother and sister went off to build the synagogue. Eventually, the time came when they were ready to launch this synagogue for what they hoped would be their growing congregation. They invite everyone to the opening of the synagogue. There's food in the congregation, as you can imagine, ready to celebrate. They have musicians ready to be dancing the horror. They have people on welcoming duty, just like we do, to ensure that no one arrives alone and leaves alone and does not get noticed and welcomed. They had it all there. But as they all turn up, they realize, even though the synagogue feels warm, even though there's food, even though there's music, there is no light in this congregation. Oh, obviously, as you can imagine, a synagogue, there starts to be murmuring of dissent. I know we can't possibly imagine what that would sound like, <laughs> but there were murmurings of dissent. Have we run out of money? Did they forget that we'd need light? How on earth are we going to manage this? Are we only going to be able to come to the synagogue in the daylight hours? Suddenly, the brother and sister said, we'll show you how the light is going to work. And one of them lit a light, lit a taper, and went over to one of the walls of the synagogue. And on the walls of this small yet big synagogue were sconces all the way along the walls with names of every member of this congregation. And they said, this is what you are going to do. You are going to bring the light from your own home to light up the synagogue. If we're very few, we'll have less light. If there are more of you coming to the synagogue, we will have more light. But more than that, if there is a corner that is unlit, we will see who is not here in the synagogue and we will be able to reach out and check on them. The community, the congregation, it was really a, a coup for a congregation to be this happy. They couldn't believe how well this had worked out. They couldn't believe that they were being told that not only were they going to supply the light, but they were going to supply 
the mood, the ambiance, the togetherness that this congregation was going to be able to rely on. And when any of them were not there, then their neighbors, their fellow congregants, their members knew that they weren't and knew that they had to check up on them. And that is the story of a synagogue way before ours that learned what it was to look after its members and to have an audacious hope that their synagogue could grow, could expand with the help of all of its members. Can you see why this story chimes so much with us? Because our synagogue is a microcosm of something so much bigger. Morris was checked up on when he wasn't here. And Morris, with his noisy commentary, so loved, so welcomed every Friday night because it was his home. And without him, we knew where he was and what we needed to do. Morris demonstrated his love for this congregation by leaving half of his modest, or it turned out to be not so modest estate to our synagogue. The other half going, as he always described it, to the land of Israel and ending up going to the Leo Beck Center in Haifa, a progressive school and institution modeled on peaceful inclusivity, so in keeping with who we are as a congregation. The point of this story that I found so irresistible for us this year, this year as we are poised on the year of our 70th anniversary, with hopes, audacious hopes of what we will do to care for, to ameliorate, to improve our synagogue, to grow, to care for our membership. That this is more, this hope, this faith is more than just a theological expression. We do it, we get it. Even the atheist amongst us get it, that our congregation is made up of individuals that we acknowledge and honor as B'Tselem Elohim in the image of God, a pillar of our community and what we believe in, permeating and inspiring everything that we do as we love to learn, to pray and to do justice together, but it's worth it because people seek us out for this and all that we hope to do to ensure to build for our future is predicated on that. And tonight it is Morris that I remember because the miracle is where we are standing. So 